button, is it? Oh, it is live now. Here we go. We're live. We are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the live stream here at the Northampton Fish Centre for the official launch of BioCard in the UK. Uh, thanks to everyone that's come today in the shop and thanks for watching everyone at home or work. Naughty, naughty. And I'm really excited to be working on BioPod again. I worked on it a few months ago over in Canada for the Skate Masters, so have a look for that. Just type in Skate Masters on YouTube and you'll see a really cool TV pilot. And today's all about making this BioPod Aqua 2 look pretty, and that's my job today. I hope you enjoy the process. Um, Lois, uh, owner of, of the Fish Centre, will be on hand to answer any questions hopefully you might have about the BioPod. We've got some other experts around here. I'm going to confess, I'm actually not an expert on reptiles and the terrestrial plants. I am kind of my, my speciality is making things look pretty, uh, and I know a little bit about you know uh, about terrestrial plants. So um, I can talk about the bipod a little bit as well, and I hope you enjoy the process. So first thing I'm going to do is just give you a brief introduction to the system. Uh, bipod is basically a smart micro habitat. Um, it's all really, really clever. It's controlled via an app on your phone or tablet. And basically you can control all of the environmental parameters. So air temperature, water temperature, ventilation, infrared, UV light, the whole, the whole sort of spectrum of environmental conditions. And, that, and that's a really cool thing because you can keep a huge variety of living things in this. Anything from salads, herbs, all the way through to really rare amphibians and reptiles and fish. So the Aqua 2, this is a, an aquatic version of the bipod, so we have a, a dedicated aquatic section in the bottom portion of the bipod, and obviously we can keep some fish in there or shrimp, and above this we've got our terrestrial portion where we grow terrestrial plants or semi-aquatic plants, and we can potentially keep uh, animals in the top portion as well. So what I've done previously to, the, uh, to filming is actually filled in a large portion of the living wall here at the back. Now I've deliberately left an open space here, uh, so I'll show you what I do. And we fill this with sphagnum moss or any kind of type of moss, and this acts as a living biological filter. So the water slowly trickles down from the top, basically acts as a biological filter for the water and purifies it. Really, really cool. Um, so we'll work from the top. We've got the LED lighting here. So a really clever LED lighting system. Can, you can control UVA, UVB and infrared with this light, with this LED. Um, very, quite powerful actually. I can't remember the actual, uh, the PAR or the lumens, but it is a very powerful light. More than capable of growing aquatic plants here in the bottom. And we've got low iron glass, which is, low iron means it's a higher clarity glass than regular iron glass. So if you look at a regular aquarium, uh, most of them are, when you look down the cross section, they're quite a dark green colour. Where this is actually a light blue, so low iron. Just gives you a high clarity when you're looking through, through the biopod. And then moving down to the bottom, we've got a really, really clever uh, ventilation system here. This effectively blows almost like warm air up the glass, and that stops the condensation, which you can get with a lot of vivariums and terrariums. So hopefully you'll just get a crystal clear look all the time. So in the bottom portion of the tank here, we have uh, two things. We've got a temperature probe, which is this black thing with a silver end. And then we've got the substrate heating cable here, which is this blue cable here. And they're all controllable, so really, really clever. And, the, and, the, and the, I think the best thing is uh, on the app, you basically choose what you want to keep in your biopod, and it will just set everything for you. So it's not complicated. You don't have to like, research loads of different things. It will just do everything for you. So whether you want to uh, grow basil or you want to keep a uh, dart frog you know it just takes all that sort of effort out for you okay so that's enough about the product itself let's talk about the actual scaping um, scaping is my passion I love to make things look beautiful and natural and um, I'm a really really big fan of a guy called Takashi Amano and he created this nature aquarium concept and I'm going to kind of use those principles in here so the nature aquarium concept is all about uh, transferring an essence of nature from outside and transferring it into your aquarium or biopod. And that's what we're going to do today. And the main things we use for this are obviously uh, living plants, live plants, we don't use plastic plants, and natural materials such as rock and um, rocks and wood. So we've got, we are live today, so they're playing this in a ring. 
So we start off with our substrate. Now we could use um, a dedicated commercial all-in-one uh, complete soil, yeah. but today I'm going to use more of a decorative gravel, and that's no problem. We can add liquid fertilizers to the uh, bio to feed the plants. We don't necessarily need to use a soil. So we've got some lovely soil here. Big fan of this stuff, really natural kind of colours. And it, and it kind of fits in with my philosophy of trying to keep things looking as natural as possible. So we just cut open the bag. And it's important, when we, before we add our substrate, it's important just to ensure that the cables are laid appropriately. Uh, make sure the, the temperature probe isn't right next to the heater cable, for instance. So just common sense really, but just do have a look at that. And then we put our layer of substrate in. And this substrate is usually relatively clean, so we don't normally need to rinse it out. If you had more time, then you might just want to rinse it out just to help prevent any cloudy water. But I tend to add the water very slowly at the end of the process, so hopefully we won't see any clouding. So now I'm just going to use a, a brand new paintbrush, it's never had paint on it obviously. And what I like to do is just have a slightly sl steeper gradient at the back than the front. So we, what this does, it helps accentuate the depth of the, of the scape. So when you look at it dead straight on, you actually get an optical illusion that the tank is actually deeper than it really is. And, I, and scoping is all about creating a sense of depth. George, I just want to say we've got 80 people watching now. Excellent. That's great. So, um, yeah, if you do, uh, if you are watching, guys, please do share it. You know, it's a, it's a really cool thing. I love skating. And it's my kind of, I'm a full-time skater, professional skater. I go all over the world doing this, based in the UK. And I just love to create, you know, beautiful things out of natural products. There's a gent called Al Walt. No pressure. Well, I didn't know if he was one of the people you knew. Uh, possibly, I met quite a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the substrate in place. You can see, hopefully, if Lois just does a side view there, you can see I've sloped the gravel deliberately more towards the rear to create, to create that sense of depth. And we do need to ensure these flats here aren't completely covered with the filtration system. <clears throat> Before I carry on with, uh, with the hardscaping process, I'm just going to carry on filling uh, these empty slats with the moss. So if you want to get a close up, we just get a nice handful of the moss and we just literally poke it in these slats here. Really, really simple. You can use sphagnum moss, which you can buy in large quantities relatively cheaply. I like this moss because it's actually more of a more of a, a bright green than regular sphagnum. And actually, you know, you, you see some bits of straw, it looks like straw, bits of grass, dead leaves. That's not a problem, it looks natural. It's going to help perform the biological filtration as well. Basically, as the water is flowing over, the moss, etc. Bacteria is going to form on it and just basically act as a, a, a nitrifying filtration system. And then all of the other plants which we're going to attach will also assist with the filtration. It's the great thing about, about living plants, growing plants, they're, they're, the, they're the world's natural filters taking carbon dioxide and produce oxygen and create a really really healthy environment for the, for the inhabitants. George if we, if we start getting questions and obviously we're going through stuff here you can go back through the live stream and answer the questions. Yeah of course so at the end of the live stream the video will be uploaded to the Reptile Centre Facebook page yep. and you can view it at your own leisure because this process is probably going to last at least an hour or two so um, cool. Yeah, and you, if you're at work and you, 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 know, you, you can't watch it, we're live right now, then do check the reptile centre later on this evening, maybe. 
Okay, so our living wall is in place now, our substrate is in place. Now, uh, one of my most favourite parts of the scaping process is called the hard scaping process, and that's really, really important in, a, in, a, in an aquascape or a, a terrascape. Um, if you think about a human being, we all have skeletons, and uh, we are forms of flesh and muscles. Now, in an aquascape or a, a terrascape, um, we use natural materials as the skeleton, hardscape. So we use rocks and wood, and we try to make a really, really kind of uh, strong, uh, high impact, uh, visually appealing hardscape. So um, I always encourage people when they go to a shop, um, and a classic shop or a Repsol shop, and you're creating something like this, or, or in a, a fully, fully aquatic aquascape, then do consider, you know, buying almost hoarding hardscape. Uh, the more you have, the more you have to choose from. Uh, the more uh, interesting creations uh, you, you can produce. So very lucky here at the at the fish centre, and lots of materials to choose from. I've chosen a few earlier on, which I've kind of prepared already. Um, but yeah, what well, in fact is a really interesting story. One of the parts of my jobs is I work for practical fish keeping, and I'm very lucky, and I go to shops all across uh, England and and abroad. And the first thing I do, as, a, as a, an aquascaper, as, as a hobbyist aquascaper, it's not just my job, it's my passion, but I always go straight to the hardscape selection. I, I kind of bypass the fish and the plants, and I just look for the most interesting rocks and wood. Okay. So yeah, hardscape is really important. So I'm going to start off with the stones, the rocks, and we've got some beautiful dragon stone here. Um, some suppliers call it brown holy rock, but you've probably heard of it as dragon stone. It is a really good idea to wash it first. It does have like a loose clay that tends to collect in these holes. So do give it a rinse out first, otherwise it will cloud your water. So when I'm, when I'm choosing stones, I'm always thinking about the character. And that sounds a bit weird, does a stone have character? But it has a visual, it has a visual presence, it has a character. And some stones, if you imagine like a big sort of rounded pebble, is, is quite boring. There's not much texture to it. There's not much interest. Whereas if you compare it to something like this, a nice piece of dragon stone, you can see it's got loads of gouges, some holes, a natural strata. The strata is really important, and we'll talk about more, more about that in a minute. But the strata is this natural line that flows through the rock. And you can see which is the most interesting side. So this side is quite boring, it's quite flat, it doesn't have much character. Whereas this side is a lot more interesting, and again this side is quite interesting. So what I do, I look at the stone I look, and I turn it in all three axes and I'm thinking, I'm visualising in my mind how that's going to sit in the substrate, what's going to look the most interesting. So, there we go. So you can see the strata, it's flowing from left to right. And actually that's an interesting point on itself. Uh, most Western people, well we all Westerners read from left to right, we write left to right. And actually we prefer to view things from left to right and so if we use this strata flowing from left to right that automatically gives us a sense of comfort and it looks more visually kind of appealing so now we're going to place it in the substrate there and one of the common mistakes is someone to maybe put it sort of that dead center and dead upright like that looks really unnatural looks unbalanced it's too symmetrical, so your eyes are actually darting from left to right because they can't settle down. Now, any photographers out there will have heard of the rule of thirds, which is a compositional guide to kind of positioning things to make it look balanced, aesthetically balanced. And we can use that in aquascaping or in scaping. So I'm just going to do that now. I'm going to position the main weight of the stone over by about a third to the left. Right, so I'm just going to push the gravel up to the stone so it looks like the stone's actually naturally coming out of the earth. So the gravel is the earth, the stone is coming out, the, the earth's been eroded away and it's left this nice stone. And you'll note that I've actually selected the gravel, uh, the sand, deliberately to match the colours of the stone as well, so that's really important. Okay, so that's our main stone in. Now we work our way down in size. Well, this is virtually the same size. It's probably not going to fit in there, so we'll just ignore that one for now. Go for our next stone, and again, we're looking at the strata, we're looking at the most interesting size. There's another good point when we're using stones and rocks, we tend to only use the same type 
in the, in the same scope. If you, if you start mixing up different materials, it looks unnatural. And if you get anything from today, it's hopefully trying to get this essence of this natural appearance and transferring it into here. So we use lessons from nature deliberately. So what I'm doing now, just positioning this one here. And you can see the natural strata is running this way, and the natural strata is running this way, and they kind of intersect, which looks quite good. And that's called creating tension. Those things are opposing each other, and we call that tension. What we can do is, we don't want tension, we can have the strata all running the same way. Like so. So, have a look at that. Do you want to come around and see it from the front? It's quite a, quite a good lesson, this one, if anyone wants to. No? Okay. <laughs> so, I want, I want a hands up now. So, who prefers this, this layout? Okay. All, all remember the flow? So, it's all flowing left to right. No tension. Now, if we do this one here, who prefers that one? Okay, so. <laughs> So hands up for that one. One, two, three, four, five. Most of us. <laughs> I think that's it. So we've all, we're already okay. Now we tend not to use odd. We tend not to use even numbers in scoping because it creates uh, potentially symmetry. So we either use we either use three or five pieces. So you select my next smallest piece down. And I think it's important that we now create a little bit of tension, because if we all were flowing the same way, I think it would look a bit too contrived. So I'll just put that one in there. Okay, I'm quite happy with that. I'm looking at it now, I'm straight on, and I'm thinking this, this here is a bit flat, a bit boring. I want a bit more height. So what I can do is cheat, and we can actually put a small stone underneath and pop it up. Like so, and just gather the sand all around the base, make it natural. Okay, so that, I'm quite happy with that stone arrangement there. Um, in, if I was doing an aquarium and we're doing stones only, that would be called an iwagumi. That's a Japanese word for rock garden. So we've done a nice sands on iwagumi, which means three stone iwagumi, three stones. We've hidden this one, so we ignore that one. <laughs> we'll plant around it as well in a moment, so it's really going to sort, sort of evolve and, 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 change, and change the whole composition, the whole impact of the layout will evolve throughout the whole process. So any questions from my live audience yet? No, we've had a few just asking about um, the, what you can keep in it and obviously we've talked a bit about, um, we're, we're going to put some uh, yellow-headed geckos in there later and yeah. um, some of the frogs and stuff. Yeah. Um, anybody else's thoughts? Fish animals. Yeah, animals. Um, I, I potentially avoid fish. I'd, I'd be really tempted to keep shrimp only. In there. Oh, nice idea. Yeah, because they create less waste, less chance of algae. Um, I'll leave the reptile choices up to you guys. That's your expertise. Um, so, but yellow-headed geckos and potentially some frogs. You were saying? Yeah. Vampire crabs. Vampire crabs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. There we go. Oh, okay. Cool. When you're putting a rock out there, do you have to worry about pressure points? Plants at the bottom or the gravel. Yeah, the gravel and, and the water will kind of take. I've never had any issues <coughs> ever. Yeah. Just don't put it straight on the glass. No, you can't knock it off. Okay. Yeah. Oh, shh, shh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but don't see me if people. Yeah. Okay, well, I think it looks quite good already, but it's going to look a lot better in a minute. Okay. So, next we move on to our wood. So, we've got some wood here. Um, I've got some wood here. Yeah. Got some lovely wood here that I pre-selected earlier. Again, really good shot for choosing some really nice materials. 
And so this, this, is this is Redmore, isn't it? This is Redmore roots. It also goes by different names from different suppliers. Azalea root or fingerwood. All the same product. Really interesting wood. I like it because it has lots of spindly branches, which give you more kind of visual interest. If you imagine comparing that to like a big lump from the panny wood or bog wood, it's pretty boring. There's not much opportunity to attach different plants to it. This is a lot more interesting, yeah. I think. So we start off with the, with the biggest piece, generally speaking, but I know this piece is going to be a bit awkward a bit later on. This takes up the most kind of surface area. So I'm going to put this piece in first. And again, using the kind of like the rule of thirds and compositional guidelines, we try to position it as naturally as possible. Um, we're a little bit limited because the surface area of the biopod is quite similar to the, sort of, the, the area of this. So we're li we are limited a little bit of options. But because it's so interesting, we could pretty much put it in any way we want and it would look fairly good, hopefully. So I'll just put it there for now. Now you see the main body of the wood is here, which is offset by a third. It matches this main stone, so it looks quite well balanced. We work our way down to the next size piece. We want to, it's a tall tank, it's the aspect ratio, which means like the length compared to the height. It has quite a tall aspect ratio, so we need to, we need to use that to our advantage and use the hardscape to generate that, to, to give that height the attention it deserves. If we just imagine, you know, really sort of low down stuff and all this empty space here, it would look a little bit boring and unbalanced. So I'm just going to pop this in. <coughs> I did a practice layout earlier, but they never, they can never get exactly the same. It doesn't really matter. The wood's so, so, so good. You can almost, you almost can't go wrong with it, I would say. I'll just pop it in there for now, and then I'll just have a little play around afterwards. So our third and final piece. going to present lots of opportunities for the animals to rest on as well. We can attach plants to it. We can see it's tall, so it gives us that height that we need. A lady called Wendy is just asking what biopod would you use for leopard geckos, for leos? Um, I think in-house we would be looking at something like the Terra. Uh, there's also a Grand, which is bigger. Oh, Depends on the amount, of course, and how many you're thinking yeah. of putting in. Okay, so that's our pretty much our hard state process complete. There's not much room for movement with the wood, but hopefully you'll agree it looks quite nice. Look, the edges are a little bit empty. But remember, we're going to be planting it, and that's going to just change the whole look again. So don't get too don't get too focused on just creating a beautiful hardscape. Remember that the, the plants are going to affect the whole visual balance to it as well. So what I do at home now, I just sit in front of it for a while, and I just have a little tweak, and I'll just keep. Can I make that look any better? If I think I can make it look better, I'll do something about it, I'll, I'll change things around. Sometimes you'll change it and you'll make, you know, you think, oh, actually, that looks worse. But that's cool, it's all part of the process. And you should take as long as you need to with the hardscaping process. Like I said, it's the backbone of the layout. It's really, really important. It's the skeleton, if you like. Everything builds around it. So if you get this bit really wet, if you get this bit nailed, and more than likely you'll get the whole scape looking really great. I just noticed that the, um, this bit here, a bit too central, I'll try and move that over to the left a touch. Bit of an empty space here, but remember we are putting plants in there. So it's too fast. Another important point to, uh, to consider is um, some wood has been like mad, it's been cut off, you know, by a saw or whatever. And that looks unnatural, that's, uh, you know, it's an obvious man-made thing. We kind of want to eliminate that from the, from the scape. So these bits here, you want to you ideally hide them. So you can two things, you can turn it around, or, that doesn't work, you can attach plants to it, mosses, rheophyte plants, such as anubias or ferns.
okay, I like that even better. Yeah. So, just tidy up again. <coughs> Okay, the next logical step is to plant the substrate because if I start planting around here, it's going to limit my access to the gravel. So, if I could just get a bucket of water, please. I've got my red colander again. <laughs> you have a colander? Yeah. Yeah, we've got we've got a mesh. Um, we've got something, haven't we, out there? That's the RO, yeah. Yeah, aquatic plant basket would be good. How strong is this? I need a. Do you need a. Um, a do you want to go and find something to sit the RO on? Oh, you want to go hide, do you? Yeah, uh, those five buckets. If you drag them all over, like a siphon, you see. I like it. Mind your head. I like how we have to. Make shift as we go. No, a little one. That's the smallest one we've got. No. Oh, we've not got any. Well, he could you he could use that and tip it in at the side wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've only got we haven't got the small ones anymore. Any so hose? hose. We can do hose. Hose. We're looking for something to, um, the hose is there. Right, they're, they're adapting. Oh, you found one, yes, of course, perfect. Oh, nice. Thanks, mate. Yeah, well thought. No, Brian's got something for that bit. You got that other RO out there as well. Don't worry about hose then if you have to stop looking for hose. got hoses. You wanna you wanna bring that other RO bucket through? Log on and see these questions coming up and answer them as an admin for in there. Um, Mark, I think you just asked a question um, about if we're at the shop setting this up today. Yes, we are. This is live now. Uh, we're going to be doing this for another hour plus, and then this evening we have an aquascape um, we're going to be doing from half past six. Um, and then Tom's asking what animals should be kept in this type. Well, we think that you need to, you know, use. Dave's just been talking about this and some crabs. Got a mouthful of food, so we won't ask him now. And um, we're going to put some yellow headed geckos in these, um, which um, one of the guys we know is, is using one of these, and they're breeding uh, very happily in those at the moment. And then obviously, any of your, any of your frogs, your dendrobates. Um, and all that looks really cool. So this is starting to look really nice now. We're getting a bit of water in. That's lovely. Oh, okay. That's enough of water for now because we just need enough to cover the there, yeah. cover the gravel, and that makes planting really easy. <coughs> um, some of the gravel tends to float on the meniscus of the water, so. Let's give that a bit of a disturb of your fingers and it'll sink. You can see the water's relatively clear already. That's a good sign. It means the gravel isn't too dirty. Okay, next we're planting. So, 
Are you, it looks like Sam's answering questions, uh, or someone is. No, that's me. Is it you? Brilliant. You have to do it as a comment, though, so it's not ideal, but as long as they keep an eye well, on Well, it pops up. Yeah. That, that works. Yeah, let's show everybody what we've got under this, um, under here. We've actually got um, a, lot of, a lot of our um, aquatic plants sitting here ready to use, um, either in this um, or the the Aqua Scraper 900 that we're doing tonight at uh, 6.30. Um, we've also got um, a lot um, we've got a lot of plants here, um, including a section that we have. And obviously, um, you know, they're going to be here. We we'll be doing a 30% discount on plants uh, over the next coming few days. So um, if you need anything, then come and see us. George is choosing some out of the tank. CO2 injection in this aquascape, in this biopod, um, so we need to limit our plant choice appropriately, so I'm going to use some relatively easy plants. Uh, we've got, the first one I'm going to use is um, Anubius Petite, so this is part of the Anubius Nana family, beautiful plant, likes to be attached to decor, which is called a rheophyte plant, so really lovely, tolerates shade, really slow growing, really easy to look after, suitable for most aquariums. Has a quite a strong, robust, waxy leaf as well, so it'll even withstand herbivorous fish a lot of the time. So we just remove the plant from its pot, take away as much of the mineral wool as possible. This is the growth medium. When I started the hobby, I just used to put the plant in, in its pot, in the tank, but plants do like to be taken out of their media like this and it gives the roots a bit more freedom to spread and it looks more attractive as well. So I'm just combing away the mineral wool there with the tweezers. You can do this underwater and it's, it's a bit easier. It doesn't matter if there's a little bit left on there, it's no problem. So a guy called Patrick's just asking why is there no soil use in these plants when they're originally made? They're actually grown on this wool, aren't they? Yeah. In, in the... Um... Yeah. So they're grown hydroponically. The plants are actually uh, exposed to the air in the nurseries and the roots actually go, actually uh, submersed in a nutrient-rich circulating water. And that's how they grow in the greenhouses. Now, this likes to be attached to decor. So... You can either tie it with fishing line or cotton, you can glue it, or you can just literally wedge it in. And then eventually the roots will spread, grip onto the, onto the wood or the rock, and then become really secure. So repeat that process, separate it from its pot, take away the mineral wool. So when I did the um, Skate Masters event in Canada, uh, which, is, which is where the, the biopods, the headquarters are, um, myself, Oliver Knott, Yifan Yang and Jared Wolf, we all set one of these up each. Um, myself and Oliver Knott, he's a very famous international aquascaper, he, uh, he, was, he did an uh, Aqua One, which is a shallower version of this. Uh, and myself, Aqua 1, and then the other two guys did an Aqua 2. And um, Oliver, Oliver's really interesting because he's just, he, he used uh, aquatic plants yeah, for the whole did. thing. Yeah. And the thing is about 90% of, 95% of aquatic plants is that they're amphibious. So they grow, they happily grow out of water. In fact, they, they're happier growing out of water than underwater because they have more access to CO2 and light. So same with this, I'm just going to tuck this in. And this is shaded, which it really 
it thrives in shade and in fact in too much light it will get algae because it's so slow growing it doesn't have a chance to fight that algae off so it's a really good idea to put it in the shade another beautiful plant this is quite new to the hobby uh, buku philandra this is a wavy green variety i'm going to separate it from its pot just by put it in the bin <laughs> Quite new to the hobby, and um, originates in Borneo. Borneo is the only place in the world that it grows, and it grows in the jungles. And um, interesting, well, quite sad, that the fact that they, uh, they're destroying the habitats, they're destroying the jungles, uh, more to do with uh, the palm oil industry. But one of the side effects of that is the, uh, the, the, a lot of the, the locals are taking this from, from nature and then selling it. Um, you know, they're literally grabbing, you know, bin bag, and sending it all over the world because it's quite a, a in-demand plant at the moment. Thankfully there are now some uh, established farms out there and they're doing it more sustainably. But yeah, just, just be careful. When you're buying your Buca Philandra plants, I would encourage you to buy from a European nursery rather than the wild, wild specimens. So exactly the same process. I'm going to poke that in there and the, the roots will eventually creep out, like I said earlier, attach themselves and become really secure. Okay, next plant. This is going to be interesting to see how this goes in, in this in this scape. Elianthe quadrico status. It used to be called um, Echinodorus quadrico status, and it's a form of uh, Amazon sword. It's basically like a, a small Amazon sword, but it is a, a is a very prolific uh, grower. It will send out um, it will send out side shoots. You can see one there already, and you just send them out and you'll get a solid carpet in no time at all. Um, doesn't, we'll get a little bit bigger than this, but I'm going to plant this in the background and what I'm hoping is it will form a nice solid carpeting background. But it, but it will, need, will need maintaining, it will need trimming, thinning out now and again. But I'm only going to put one in and then I can pretty much guarantee in a few weeks this will have spread across the whole background. In fact, um, do you want to see if there's, who is a star? Can you see if there's any more of that? Uh, Helianthum could be co-starters. So it might be some in the uh, wet system. Okay, so preparing the plant exactly the same as before. Separate it from its rock wool. Grab it in your tweezers now. And then we just pop that into the substrate with the tweezers. Gently remove the tweezers and then the plant will stay there. Really simple. Okay, while well, my colleagues are getting the other plants, I'm just going to show you a really, really cool plant now. This is um, Litterella. This is a carpet, another carpeting plant. Perfect, thanks. Litterella, carpeting plant. Similar kind of process to the Quadrico Startus, but a lot smaller. But the really interesting thing about this is it's 1 2 grow, <coughs> tropical 1 2 grow, which is tissue cultured. For those that don't know what tissue culture means, it means basically it's grown in a laboratory in sterile conditions. And the advantages to that are that it's free from algae, free from snails, free from pesticides. Um, actually, you get loads for your money. It looks like a you know, small quantity, you know, small portion. But actually, there are literally hundreds of plants there because they're so small. So we just separate it from its pot. It's grown in like a liquid, uh, nutrient-rich <coughs> jelly. Get rid of that. And now we have have a bunch of plants if you like. All the roots are kind of intertwined. Makes it quite tricky to separate. I'll show you a trick in a minute. Now we need to get rid of this nutrient rich uh, liquid here. So you can either rinse it in water or you can just flick it off. And now what we do is we separate that into individual portions. So you can separate it into as many portions as you like. Basically, each vertical element of the plant there is a separate plant. So you're looking at over well over 100 plants there. I'm not going to separate it 100 times because that would take too long and it would be really tedious. But I can just break it apart gently, like so. It doesn't matter if you lose a few leaves. Tissue culture plants are very robust in terms of generating new growth. You do need to feed them with a decent liquid fertiliser. 
from the start. They're basically baby plants. And like baby humans, they need lots of food and they need it frequently. So what I would recommend in this situation is to dose a, a complete liquid plant food, such as the aquascaper, complete liquid plant food. We have, yeah, we have yeah. actually got some here. Um, really, really good product. I helped develop it, so I'm going to say that. But, um, yeah. Develop this in uh, conjunction with Evolution Aqua. It's a complete, what it means is complete. It means it contains all the nutrients that plants need, aquatic plants need. Um, a lot of manufacturers will give you uh, three or four bottles to get that whole range, um, but it all comes in one handy bottle and it's designed to be dosed every day. And most other liquid fertilizers say dose once a week, but plants actually prefer a daily dose. It's like, you know, much better to eat lots of small meals than one massive one. So, really good product. 12.99 for 500 mil. Uh, I think the water capacity in here is probably about, I don't know, do you know the water capacity? I don't know, do we know what the water capacity is in that? Let's say, 50 litres. let's say it's 50 litres and I would call this a, a low to medium energy tank. So the good thing about the, the, our, our complete plant food is it actually tells you the instructions how much to dose per day for the size of the tank. But not only the size of the tank, the type of system you've got. So if you've got a high light and you're injecting CO2, the plants need more fertiliser because they want to grow more quickly because they've got that they've got more light and they've got more co2 so they want to go really fast and if they want to go really fast they need more food so for a high energy system in a 50 litre aquarium you'll be dosing five mil of the of the complete liquid plant food every day i wouldn't say this is a high energy system i'd say this is a medium energy system so in that case we dose two mil per day of the complete liquid plant food that will also help uh, the terrestrial plants grow because it contains all the nutrients that all plants need. So, same as before, planting the Echinodorus, uh, not Echinodorus, Helianthum. Just grab your portion. It doesn't look too pretty at the moment, but in a few days the plant will uplight itself. They're all phototropic, which means they grow towards the light. and they'll look a lot more attractive. And then, in a few weeks, I'd like to think that this, will again, will form a solid carpet across the front of the uh, escape. The this is the aquascape, if you like. This is the terrascape. So, full carpet at the back, full carpet at the front, some lovely plants around the mid-ground, and it'll look nice and green and lush. So we'll just carry on with this process. If you haven't got any tweezers yet, and, you're into your, and you want to get into scaping, and tweezers are absolutely essential. You can imagine trying to plant this with your fingers. Very, very tricky. You can see what an individual plant looks like. <laughs> so you can imagine trying to plant that, you know, literally hundreds of times. And it is something I've done. <laughs> so I had a, a pot, one pot of um, tissue cultured uh, Microanthum and Monte Carlo, which is a very popular carpeting plant. And I wondered if, if I could grow a whole full carpet, a 60 centimetre tank, could I grow a whole dense carpet of this plant with just one pot. So I teased apart every tiny stem like this, uh, probably about six to eight hundred of them, and I meticulously planted each one. I like went into some sort of meditative state. Um, I think red wine was involved and, uh, and drum and bass music. <laughs> and yeah, I just did it and it turned out really well. In fact, some, uh, a writer, someone did, wrote a 3,000 word Oh, cool. Peace on it. <laughs> I did, seriously. Yeah, because they deconstructed the, the actual layout was like an irrigation with loads of rocks and stuff. And it's actually quite a cool scape, if I do say so myself. Um, yeah, they wrote a 3,000 word thesis on it, basically. 
Okay, so it looks quite, it doesn't look very dense planting at the moment, but I want to just show you how hopefully this tank will be really visited. You know, check out the uh, reptile centre and the fish centre Facebook pages, hopefully for updates on the how this establishes and grows in. I'm sure I'll be sharing regular updates with you guys. Um, so I just wanted to show you how plants can develop over time, grow in, and hopefully prove that the system works. Okay, so this is Pagostum erectus, beautiful plant, known in uh, known commonly as um, little star, I think, downoy. So you can see the leaf shape, beautiful crinkled leaves. I'm going to plant this in the mid ground. And again, this will send out new, new shoots, become quite dense, and hopefully form a really attractive mid-ground. Quite a new plant to the hobby, been around about 10 years. So very lucky to have access to some very good quality plants here at the fish centre. Um, one of the things I like to do, uh, I establish a relationship with, with the shop and I find out when they're going to get their plants delivered and then that's when I buy them because they're going to be their best quality. Um, a lot of plants are stored underwater, so these are grown out of water, so they, they're actually a different the plant's in a different form. It's uh, adapted itself to going out of water, which means it's more robust. It has to support its own weight, because it's uh, obviously grown in the air. Um, and it's, it's, it has advantages. It adapts more readily to different water chemistries. It ships better, so you can imagine a, a box full of plants that are quite robust, they're gonna ship better than a, a, a plant that's adapted to underwater, and that's really flimsy, because it hasn't got to support its own weight. So, really good idea to buy them when they're still in their immersed state, their out of water state. If you buy them when they, if they, if you buy them when they're adapted to their underwater state, then there's a risk that the plant might suffer. So, let's say you buy them from here, they've adapted to, they've been kept in their tank over there for a good few weeks, uh, they've adapted to their underwater state, and you have a different water chemistry to the shop. Then potentially that plant is going to struggle adapting to your water chemistry. So I'm not seeing the replies, I'm just seeing the questions. Really, really good to um, buy the plants as new as possible. Or alternatively, you know, you might be able to find a supplier that grows them hydroponically, but they're very rare in the UK. So just repeat the process. Separate the plant from the rock wool or mineral wool. Oh, you don't need the. Grab the plant by the roots. So I'm hopeful that the, the light will be powerful enough to penetrate the canopy here and grow these aquatic plants. Um, it should be, it is a powerful light. I can't remember the figures. Uh, if anyone from Biopod themselves are watching, I'm sure they can let us know what the figures are. I just remember being quite impressed by how bright it is. And it's interesting, you know, because it looks bright, doesn't necessarily, in, in the aquariums, you know, I often get asked, or I often, um, speak to someone that's struggling growing their plants, I'll say, oh, what lighting have you got? They don't know, but they say, oh, but it's really bright. That doesn't mean anything, because your eyes actually uh, can see brightness, but that's not necessarily how, how the plant sees it. So we've just got someone called Mark asking, will there be people available at the shop to help choosing the right one most days? If you're meeting the biopods, that is absolutely, yeah, we're, we're here for you. We're open seven days a week. Um, we have two stores, we have one, um, on the Weaving Road in Northampton that is just solely reptiles and we have the one here at Bell Plantation Toaster which is reptiles and fish um, so you know you can come along to either 
um, but we are about. Um, the one at Bell Plantation Toaster does have the aquatic plants as well, whereas Northampton doesn't, so uh, it may be this is a better solution for you. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sprayer? Please. Yeah, I don't know where that went, they'll grab that. Mm. Okay, so that's the last of the proboscis and are very implanted. <laughs> okay, just conscious that the anubius might dry out. Okay, just give that a bit of a spray. Okay, just going to finish off the background planting now with the Helianthum quadrigo spartus. So there are some dying leaves on here, so I'll just get rid of them. What happens is, if you planted that in a now, the plant's going to actually put a lot of energy into trying to repair those unhealthy leaves. So you're actually best off getting rid of them, and it puts that energy into growing new growth, which is what we want to see. So when you buy your plants, just have a look at them, make sure they're healthy. Try and choose the best, you know, the most healthiest plant you can. Don't be shy with the shop owner or the, the you know, the, the star member of staff. Point to the actual plant that you want. Very popular in the background. And then last one. <laughs> Again, removing those unhealthy leaves. You can see the yellowing there. Just sort of starting to die off. This, I'll get rid of this as well. Another yellow leaf and a completely dead leaf there. And you can, act, you can remove quite a lot of the leaves and they'll soon grow. As long as the roots are healthy. The white roots there, that means the plant's relatively healthy. You know that's going to be okay. But I think one of the common mistakes when people start a planted tank is they don't actually start off with enough plants. So if you think about plants and algae always in competition with each other. If you, the more plants you have and the better you look after those plants, the less chance algae will have. So start off, plant really heavily, feed the plants with a good quality liquid fertilizer. Give them enough light. Give them CO2 injection if you can. We're not using that today, but we will definitely be using one on the on the tank I'm going to be aquascaping this evening. So if you are around, uh, we're doing a live another live stream at half past six this evening and an aquascape at 900. So do tune in for that. That is my speciality. I'll get even more excited about that than this. <laughs> Believe it or not. Okay. So that's the underwater planting done. So just a quick recap of what we've done so far. We installed our living wall here with some moss, poked it into the individual porch, into the individual cavities. Uh, then we put our gravel in, just an inert gravel. We're not going to feed the plants through the roots necessarily. We're going to use a liquid fertilizer, uh, the aquascape for complete liquid plant food. Uh, then we have used our hardscape. We talked about hardscape, how important it is for the backbone of the layout. So we, uh, we put some nice dragonstone in and we positioned it carefully. We paid attention to the strata and the whole aesthetic balance. And then we put some red mall root in to give us this lovely height. Uh, lots of interest with these spindly branches, lots of opportunity to attach our terrestrial plants. Any questions from my live audience? Or real audience even? The real audience. <laughs> Very no? good. I think we're on top of the line. Any questions that are coming up online, we're putting some answers straight up for them. Good. Yeah, so if you have any questions online, guys, then do ask away. Uh, we've got a, an expert <laughs> on the computer right now. <laughs> George, would you start fertilising <laughs> straight away from day one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The plants have a... It's a good question. Um, the plants have a large nutrient store already, um, but they use a lot of energy... Um, 
when they make that transition from immersed growth to submersed growth, so above water to underwater, they go through a lot of physical changes. And to do that, they need a lot of nutrients. And so if we give, those, we give the nutrients that from day one, they get the best chance possible. It's all about almost spoiling the plants, giving them exactly what they want, more than what they want. So they, they grow really, really healthily, really robust. And then that fights off any algae, potential algae issues. So uh, I would uh, feed these plants from today. I would put two millimetres of complete liquid plant food in every day. And then I would change half of this water every week. I'll write that down for you if you want. Yeah, no, it's yeah, fine. It's easy to remember, isn't it? And that's my philosophy. That's how I do plant and tanks. And I've used that system for, for 10 years plus. Give the plants a little bit more than they need every day. Change half of the water every week. And then you can go and see the plants are getting well fed. Really simple. Don't need to test the water for nutrients because you know if you're getting healthy plant growth, that 50% water change is going to reset those levels every week. Really easy. I like to keep things simple. Okay, now uh, the most challenging part for me, but potentially the best part of the from the escaping, is the use of these beautiful terrestrial plants uh, supplied by Peregrine Life Foods. So shout out to my friend over there. He's going to give me some uh, <laughs> tips, hopefully, if I need them. So I do apologise. I'm not an expert on, on terrestrial plants. I'm, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with just making things look pretty. So there we go. So first thing I'm going to think about is uh, the overall uh, composition. And I like to work in themes. So I don't just randomly stick plants everywhere and think, oh, that, does that look OK? I think in my head, I have a vision, and I think, you know, what kind of theme am I going to employ in this, in this scape? So I like, I like to use colour in plants, but I don't like to use too much. I think colour should be used as just a bit of a highlight, just an added interest. Uh, if we just put loads of different mishmash of colours in here, I think it would look confusing. I think you know, it would look a little bit gaudy and it would be too kind of in your face. So um, going back to my original principle of the nature aquarium, is trying to mimic that aspect, that, that essence of nature from outside and bring it into the scape, into the biopod. So with that in mind, I'm going to start off with almost like a, um, uh, a background plant in terms of a, a coherent theme. So I'm going to use... Where are they? Here they are. Now somebody's just asking again about how often we do water changes. We've just said that um, we're going to feed every day with fertiliser yeah. and we are going to do a half water change every week. Um, what we haven't touched upon is whether people should be using RO water or uh, tap water and I think that's very much depends on how hard your water is at home. We are using RO water in We're here. using RO water today, yeah. it's a really good point, especially in a biopod because it's basically a, an enclosed glass box. The issue, potential issue with hard water is once it dries yeah. you get a hard water deposit which looks really ugly. Now the plants aren't fussy generally speaking, uh, but it's all to do with how, you know, the aesthetic. Do you want to be clearing that glass every day or every week for, for the hard water deposits? They can be quite tricky to remove as well. Um, so if, if, if I had access to RO water, uh, and I know for a fact the plants are going to be fine with RO water, um, then I'd probably Is go. RO water something we can um, get to people through Peregrine Life Foods? Do we yes, have it? Uh, Okay, so we, we can actually send RO water if people can't get to local okay. shops that have it. Alternatively, uh, if you don't mind wiping the glass or you don't mind a little bit of hard water deposit on there, then you can keep everything in, in hard tap water, no problem. In aquariums, I just use tap water, whatever the location, because um, I'm quite happy once the, once the water evaporates a little bit, it's just a case of just wiping that top portion yeah. of, the, of the glass and it's fine. But in an, in an enclosed glass box like this, We've got spray misters, which will potentially, obviously, spray onto the glass. Yeah. That water evaporates, and then you get left with that horrible kind of um, hard water deposit. Now, Mark's asking about whether the biopod has got a drain for the water. I don't believe it has. Um, it, it would have to be siphoned. No, it's, yeah, it's Dave's simple. replying to you now on the computer. Very, very, it's a simple case of siphoning. So Siphon, you have a bit of hose about this long, 16 mil, 12 mil hose. Pop it in there. What I like to do is just give the plants a little bit of a wave, just to dislodge any uh, detritus that's settled on the leaves. Give that a bit of a wave while, whilst you're siphoning. 
give the substrate a bit of a wave. Don't need to don't need to clean the substrate. The substrate is part of the uh, the filtration. The plant roots will, will spread along the, along the substrate, help oxygenate, etc. Yeah. No need to clean that. So just give it give it a bit of a wave. We'll see a lot of the detritus, a lot of the waste organics floating in the water. Aside from that out, it's part of the water change. Fresh water back in. Jobs are good and probably 10, 20 minute job. Yeah. Most. And we're being re-asked about how heavily to s you can stock it with fish. We have sort of said that that really, you know, we've talked about shrimp and invertebrates, haven't we? Yeah, I mean, and, you, you, and could, you could stock it. You could probably, it's more to do with swimming space. Filtration-wise, it's going to be pretty epic in here. You've got a huge amount of biological filtration, uh, arguably more than, a, you know, a really high-end canister filter, I would say. Yeah. So in terms of um, coping with bio loads, Stocking isn't necessarily an issue. It's more to do with swimming space. It's a shallow tank. It's not a massive surface area, so you could keep, you know, you could probably get away with a good dozen, twenty small fish if you're so inclined. Um, for me, I would, I would stick with shrimp. I'm a big shrimp fan. Shrimp create li very little bio loads, so they're not going to contribute to algae. In fact, they're constantly grazing the surfaces with biofilm, etc., yeah. which helps to minimise algae anyway. And there's a lot, and and. Shrimp are really cool, and shrimp act more naturally, a lot more naturally, and they'll breed more prolifically without fish. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, uh, shrimp is my preference. Absolutely no problem with stocking the fish, though. No, absolutely no problem. The temperature can be uh, obviously controlled by your app, so you, try, you can keep tropical fish. If you didn't, you could even, you know, you could go if you're keeping subtropical stuff, you could do that as well. You could complete control, like I said. <coughs> you're welcome, Craig. Okay, so I'm going to attach like the base part if you like, and I like to use really fine textures in scaping. They create a really good sense of scale. If you imagine, I just use like three or four huge bulbous, you know, massive leaf plants in there. It would look quite boring. It wouldn't be much to look at. Not much interest. It wouldn't create a very good sense of scale. You, you would see that the tank is only this wide. But if you use really really fine textures like this then a lot more intricate details, a lot more to look at, a lot more interest, and arguably, um, you know, lots of, lots of small plants probably give you a better biological filtration capacity as well. So, I'm going to start off with this beauty, which is called Cella Ginella. Is that right? Yes, there we go. So, I do excuse my ignorance on special parts. So, Sarah Janella, move it from its pot. I'm going to get rid of a lot of the soil. There's no need. The soil is a, is a, a form of nutrients for, for the plants. But I'm going to attach it to the living moss there, and that is going to perform a very similar function to the soil. The soil, you know, it's actually going to potentially um, discolour the water as well. I like to see clear water, unless I'm deliberately going for a black water kind of habitat. But I try and remove as much as that as I can. So pretty much the same process as before with the mineral wool. We're actually getting rid of the soil instead. Uh, yeah, you could rinse it off, um, shake it. I'm going to be honest with you, this is the first time I've done this, so I'm just pretending I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. <laughs> that, was a, that was a joke, guys. Of course. <laughs> Everyone laughed anyway. Right, okay. So I'm going to split this up now into three or four quarters. And then. And we'll start from the top, poke it in the slats at the back. And because we've got this nice moss wall behind it, we don't need to necessarily completely cover it with our feature plants. They'll grow, they'll creep along, 
and eventually form a really natural kind of wall, if you like. Ooh. Sorry. So that's the Saraginella in there. Similar texture now. We'll start off with the darkest. This is called Solar... Selenaria. Selenaria. So same as before. This is a bit more wet, the soil. This is uh, really, I've grown this before in, uh, in what we call a paludarium. This has been grown out the top of it. Quite prolific, quite, quite um, a fast grower. Uh, beautiful for filling in spaces quite quickly. And the faster the plant is growing, the more nutrients it's using. So that's a good thing for the, for the living things in there. We don't want to be seeing high levels of nitrates, etc. Plants are really, really good at using up nutrients. They produce oxygen as well, which is obviously really good for the inhabitants. You know, and I, if I was, if I lived in like London or a city, and I didn't have a garden, if I lived in an apartment, you know, and, you know, a biopod is a really good way to kind of get closer to nature really important I think for humans to to exist with nature I think with modern society tends to want to remove you from nature and I think this is a really nice way just to get back you know that natural connection and um, you know the biopod is a really really great way of sort of combining you know high technology with that basic kind of human need to be amongst green things. Okay, so I'm just going to move over towards the centre a bit now. <coughs> now I'm already thinking in my mind, okay, we need a focal plant. Where am I going to put that? If you remember back to the beginning of the, the talk, the demonstration, we uh, talked about the role of thirds. We talked about it here, remember? Yeah. This main point here. So for me, I think it would be a natural point to, to put a feature plant. So I'm not going to spend too much attention around this point because I know that's where I'm going to put my feature plant. Okay, moving on to the next kind of darker screen. Solaris. I can never pronounce it. <laughs> Solarilia. Solar Solarilia. I'm just going to call it Sol. From now on. Okay, same as before, you get the idea now. So you can see I'm being quite brutal with the plant, but it's a really healthy specimen. I know for a fact that it's going to grow really well in the biopod, send out new roots, send out new growth, attach, attach itself to that moss wall, no problem. Now we were talking about you know your hooks and things to hold plants in, but yeah. this will, with you pushing in, will mesh itself in naturally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so cool. really, really easy way of planting. I'm a big fan of keeping things simple if I can. Um, I don't like tying things to things. You know, I don't like using fishing line or cotton. You know, I just like to sort of push things in and let the plant do its own thing. And with these plants, is there going to be much trimming or upkeep with these, or are they? Are they yeah, going? yeah, potentially is uh, is a fast grower. Yeah. So you can either just hold the thing in there and just pull away, or you can use scissors. Okay. Um, but bear in mind, wherever you cut from, it will send out two new shoots. Okay. So it can potentially. So yeah, well, it might sure. be uh, fairly high maintenance. But you've got some brilliant staff here, I'm sure to. <laughs> yes. That's what these are, they're like yeah, a carpet. Okay. So we're just Dave's just saying there these are <laughs> like a carpet plant. They, they they sort of don't come out forwards, they they creep along the, the, the surface and sort of fill the surface, which is exactly what you want really. Yeah. So just working on to another one. Yeah, deliberately kind of mixing the colours up a bit. You can see they're different shades of green. If we just did like a solid uh, load of dark green, then medium and light green, it'd look unnatural. So it's important to kind of mix them up a bit. 
just walk through, don't worry. This is like the base layer, if, if you like, on top of the, um, the base layer is obviously the moss. This is our like, base plant, it's going to form the majority of the texture of the scape. Rachel's just giving the, um, the plants a bit of a spray down here, which we're going to use later. It's a little bit patchwork at the moment. We'll give it a few weeks, all those textures are gonna, all those colours are gonna mould into each other, create a really nice overall texture. Oh, the just dropped it. Okay. We're going to work our way up in size in terms of texture. Before I do that, I'm going to think about our focal point plan. Let's go for a Vermeer, I reckon. Upstairs in my computer bag. No. No. Sweet enough. This is the battery's done on this. He's just bringing down the charger. We need to. Yeah, that. Perfect. So, this is a Bromeliad. We've got knots. I didn't want to use something too big. I didn't want to sort of overwhelm the scape, but they were a huge plant. Just a little bit of colour in there, just a hint of red, just to give the scape some interest. And if we just pop that. The elastic bands off of this so we can take it off. Try not to leave the tripod. Okay, I'm happy with that. Now, this is a, a definite kind of variegated leaf shape here, and I'm going to extend that kind of texture using these. Using these beautiful chlorophytums, very similar leaf texture and colour. We can actually split that up a bit as well. So we're working our way out from the vocal plant here. But we're using that similar texture, similar colour leaf form of the bromeliad. Yeah, these slats are really great. You can literally just poke the plants in. I do have some hooks to use if we need. These are a really effective way. What we've got to remember is if people are doing it and they've got lizards and things going in, that we've just got to be a bit thoughtful if thing, that things are, you know, that yeah, okay. it has a chance to, uh, to come catch out. It in, yeah, in the yeah, reptile okay. industry. We've got to think so I'll use a, um, a few I'll hooks use a if, it, yeah, if they're needed. Yeah. Can I have a clip? I've got them here. So, here's one I made earlier. So one of my colleagues made earlier. Thank you very much. So we've <laughs> basically extended out some uh, paper clips and made a little hook here. I'm just going to bend them back a little bit more. And then what we can do there is we just slot our plant in between there like so. And then you can see those hooks there. They hook over your slat. So if we go 
No pressure, George. <laughs> no one's watching. Feel where your slat is. Never do live streams with books. Okay, let's try again. So that's going to don't need to go. It's that way. <laughs> oh, that's my hurt. Losing those views now. Who is this guy? Okay. There you go. Now hopefully that will stand any reptilian contact. And then just one more down here. I can get my. That's where I need like baby hands. Let's go in that way. Mm. Okay, you see the scape's starting to really kind of take its own on now. Some definite kind of gaps in here, which I'm going to use some slightly bigger textures just to kind of give a more naturalistic feel. So I've got some beautiful Britonia here. There are actually some coloured ones which I might just use a bit later. We'll see how we go. This is a nice one as well. This is a Kelia. So let's go for the Pilia next because that's quite similar texture to the Sol, as I like to call it. This looks like it's going to be quite a fast grower, where's, uh, yeah. where's Mac? Yeah. 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 Looks like it tolerates very dry conditions, judging by the soil. You probably don't need much of this to get things going, so I'll just get a bunch of it. Sorry? Oh, okay. Oh, there, yeah, got it. Thanks, mate. Okay, let's just pop that in there. So, if this, if this was me at home, I'd probably plant like I am now and I'll give it a few good few weeks before I added any animals. Let those plants really establish, get the filtration working really well. You could put your shrimp in there or your fish but because of the way I'm planting if I let it mature those, those roots are really going to embed into that living wall at the back and then hopefully if you, if you do add reptiles then they're gonna those plants are going to be robust enough to withstand them. So we've got a little gap there, hopefully we can just plug that. George, Mark's just asked, is the, um, the water going to drip th through the back constantly, like a dripper wall? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we think so. Pretty sure, so like, uh, that's part of the filtration process, the living wall. So the water's like uh, always kind of dripping down, picking up the oxygenated water from the plant roots, and as it goes down it's going to be basically biologically filtering that water. Okay, working up our way in texture size now. Can anyone tell me what this part's called? Uh, that's a different camera. 
That is a pillia, but a different species. Quite a waxy leaf. Gives a different colour and texture to the skate. Now let's go to our uh, Petonia, beautiful colours, white and green obviously variegated, you can see those white veins, really quite stunning. Sorry. Sorry, I don't think, <laughs> don't think anyone noticed, I think you're alright. <laughs> Okay, I'm conscious this is quite a high impact colour and texture, so I'm going to kind of blend it in, hopefully, just around here. And again. Tom's asked, is Tom chatting there? What's he saying? The drip in the living wall will automatically regulate based on the species habitat you set. It is not constantly on. Ah. Thank you, Tom. Uh, explain to everybody, Tom is one of the guys who's developed this product, isn't he? Um, Tom Lamb. Tom Lamb. He's co-owner of Firefox. Yeah. So he knows more about it than anyone else, pretty much. I'm glad you're uh, following, Tom. You can put any comments up there as you like. <laughs> well, that's nice. Nice bit of texture. Yeah, and it's important to realise it's going to mature as well. The whole, it'll look quite sterile and new and, you know, kind of contrived at the moment. But as it matures and grows in, it's just going to take on a whole new life, if you like. Now, big fan of birds in aquatics and non-aquatics. So this one is called... Is there a camera in them all, or is there an option that you can see what's going on in the camera? Um, yeah, there's a camera in there all the time. Do we... Top right, top right, isn't it, the feed of the camera? You can actually see if I put the... Um, this in there, that there is the camera. So that's in the top right of each one. Um, if I pretend that I'm a camera, and it'll give you sort of some idea, which is really great actually, because where we've ended, get, ended up with this here, it actually will um, show any animals or whatever you've got going on up there. Okay, the fern's quite dominant. Don't want to put it too central, because it's going to look a bit symmetrical. But I want to fill up this left space here. Ferns tend to prefer shaded areas, so it makes sense to put it towards the bottom of the biopod. The lovely space there, just to the left. It's going to transform the layout straight away, I think. And that's going to be fixed on the wood, is it, or down into your... Yeah, just on the wood. So it's like an epiphyte plant. So it'll grow happily attached to something. Just like ferns in nature. Would it matter if you build that pile of water that's surviving the real wet yeah, well, yeah, ferns are that basically. It's a good, it's a good point. I'm gonna. It won't. If the, it'll probably be fine with the roots in the water, but the actual leaves, this this species, would, wouldn't do too well. So, getting a bit carried away. <laughs> we need to go a bit higher on that. Maybe we go to the right then. Well, yeah, quite a natural hook there. For it. So I'm not too, we might lose some of those. This is the thing about scraping, don't necessarily go with your first instinct, no one's perfect. Go 
pay for another one now and then, I think. So, hopefully you'll see a bit of a theme, quite fine textures. The only real focal plant we've got at the moment is that red bromeliad. And even that's not too dominant. So, happy to hear any feedback you guys might have. If you've got any ideas, you can see the plants I've got. Yeah, that was a natural hook there, wasn't yeah, it? In the, um So we are filling up to here with water, so I'm thinking we might need some more aquatics around here. At the back, yeah. Yeah, so we do have some java ferns. If we don't, we only probably need one. Microsorum terrapus, the classic java fern. Anyone in aquatics has probably heard of java fern. Probably one of the most famous aquatic plants out there. And I'm just going to fill in this place here. And the fern kind of gives the same aesthetic as the terrestrial fern as well, which I quite like the, mim the mimic of the above and below water. Okay, so we've got some gaps here that I'd like to fill in, right at the top, also around the centre and right. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is a lovely plant. I've seen this before, I can't remember what it's called. Type of fern again. No, my it's friend has. Micro what you think? I think it's microsporum. a lovely plant. It's a bit dominant, I'm not sure. It's going to smother. Maybe it's going to end up being... Yeah, give that one a miss I think. The colour there. I think so. Yeah. They, they look really nice in, in the bottle pots. We've, we've already made up these. Yeah. Nice as well. Okay, so. Moon and Bacchia. That's it. Moon and Bacchia, quite similar to the Sol. So that's going to look quite nice just amongst that. Mm -hmm. It is actually the fact that when people do this, you know, it is don't skimp, isn't it? It's it's don't be shy to spend a bit of money on the plants oh, to yeah. make it look. Because look at that now, that's looking te very low, low textures. The pink, oh, hold on, the pink, the pink Fitonia is lovely, says Sam. Hi, Sam. Uh, Sam is uh, my uh, area manager of the two stores, and Sam's poorly at home. And I'm, I bet she's absolutely gutted not to be here. But you do know the plants, don't you, darling? <laughs> Put some, maybe some pinks around this one to get a bit of a uh, petonia party. Petonia party. <laughs> Is that the petonia? Yeah. Yeah, you see, I love that. That's what, she, yeah, we... There's a pink one as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So those two together, I think, would look quite nice. They would look lovely. Yeah. So we've got a bit of a colour, another colour going on. We don't just have, we don't just have, need to have one area of the colour. The scope is big enough so you can get away with a little more, it might not nice up there on the left actually. Conscious of this here, looks a bit unnatural, looks a bit bare, looks a bit sterile. So a couple of things we can do, we can attach some rhyophytes, we can attach some moss. So we've got some frog moss, which I'm hoping would grow on here. Yeah, on the wood. Yeah. So this is really cool, nice bright green colour. It's going to give us instant impact, instant sense of maturity. I'm actually going to, it's actually kind of grown on wood already, so I'm just going to get rid of that wood. Do you have that super glue, guys? Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not, yeah. The, not the gorilla stuff, the other, yeah. the think, less yeah. stinky stuff. I've <laughs> yeah. uh, got the sprayer. Can you go to the chat a second, Alright. It's right. It's quite brittle at the moment, so I'm just going to spray it, give us a bit more tactile. Yeah, give that a twist and that'll pop back down. No, the, uh, the little, that's it, that's the pressure there. Giving it a squeeze to make it much easier to form and glue onto yeah, the yeah. onto the wood. Loads here. I love the way it stays bright green even though it's kind of so dried up. Is that the one that's out of the, um, the box we have looked at? Frog, yeah, yeah, the frog yeah, moss, yeah. yeah. It looks like a pissidence. So any aquascapers out there have probably heard of pissidens. Beautiful texture. Just getting rid of all that gunk there. Squeeze. We just we have a little bit of a tidy up around there. Sounds so beautiful. Oh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> the glass is actually so you can see it. That's not my isn't it? <laughs> right, where do I put my moss? There it is. Is that the, that's the smelly stuff in it? Is that the normal liquid? I've got the liquid, yeah. That doesn't smell. Yeah, I'll get rid of that for you. Yeah, yeah it's a bit smelly, isn't it? Yeah, it's the other one. Can I come and join you while you're doing this? So I'm just going to glue it on there like that. It's going to give us an immediate sense of maturity. Maybe a bit here as well. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. That's pretty fine, yeah, yeah.
Right, super glue. I don't know if you knew, it needs to be uh, moist to work. So. Mm. That's nice glue, that. Is it? Yeah, good. The we only need a tiny bit of glue. Yeah. Do little detailing bits now. And you can just stick little twigs in. Um, shallow water. Shallow water. Guess that's a good question. He's asking if the moss is going to grow along that piece of wood or just outwards. Just wonder if it's got nothing else to root onto. Yeah. That, are you imagining that, that moss that you've glued on is going to grow along the piece of wood? Yeah, it should do. do. It, will, it will just kind of yeah creep along and just form a little ball, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Sure it would in a, in a classic moss would do. I'm assuming. It's yeah. As long as it's got something to root onto, I suppose it will just creep along. Um, yeah. 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 The, the mosses in nature um, are epiphytic or rheophytic, so they naturally attach themselves to even a nut. Yeah. Stuff so it don't need much nutrients at all. Okay, we've got a bit of a, a definite empty space here, so I'm thinking don't want to compete too much with these focal points, so I want something relatively subtle. So, this is another nice one I think we used this earlier around here. So, we have that theme going along there, which is looking attractive. How long is the stream being known for? It's going to be a couple of hours now, isn't it? Are you saying how long is the stream? I haven't got a time on this one. How long is the stream? 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 Okay. It's been Okay, that's the main composition done now. Now it's just thinking about the details, just to give it that extra sense of maturity, that extra sense of like it's rolling in. If you do it at home, you wouldn't need to do all these details perhaps, you'd be quite happy with this, but I'm a little bit, uh, it's my job to make things look pretty, so just want my best. Okay, what have we got here then? Some tweezers. Oh, Ooh. just fell out. Oh dear. I'll take a photo in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Manual, so I could have done. 
It's all about the details now, and details matter. So each element of the detail on its own isn't going to make any real difference. But if you add lots of details, then it can create a really, really different kind of vibe. sort of spring towels and everything the same way with that? It's more or? difficult. We've got, um, we've got core coat that goes down through the sand into the drainage layer and you'll get spring towels and things living in there. Okay. But it's not the same as a forest cell. Are more. you putting a glass tray at the bottom to do it or just in... in no, it's in a glass tank. Just on the boat. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so the temperature ranges on the tanks? Uh, well, we've got... Um, we use Lucky Reptile Bright Sun because it's got really good mark rate as well. So you can get a Desert beetles. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Really interesting. If you like beetles. As an inverted person, you do. You're an inverted person. That's a you know, it's inverted. <laughs> Lives upside down. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you know when you're done? Well, I look at it and I'm happy. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Tons of experience. You can do too much. You can overdo it. So that's sometimes less is more. And you have to consider it's a balance between how is it going to look when it's grown in and how is it going to look instantly for sort of the viewers at home and for people looking at it today. So it's a balance in that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There you go, shout out to Sean for that suggestion. So I'm trying to imagine it full of water as well. Quite a lot of empty space here. So let's have a look. Second. I have to drop this live in a second, but I'll call them to you. Okay, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, I think we're at the point now where we can fill it with water. Yep. And then turn on the filtration system. Okay. Oh, some coffee first. Oh, yeah. Looking lovely. Even this texture here is quite interesting, isn't it? The back of the fur. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Is what you is it what you envisaged? Visaged? Yeah, I think so. I didn't know what plants we were getting, so yes. I do like the, the way the moss using the um, super glue. You can actually put the moss on the. Yeah, it looks a bit too. Um, it's in too much contrast. The back looks really mature and I've <laughs> been there for years, whereas the wood looks too sterile. So the moss just helps soften that. The transition that comes from us. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. well, most aquatic plants are actually better off out of water. Because if you, I suppose, if you had that pepper on there, some of that pepper would change the effect. Really good. I mean, ideally, I'd use um, just aquatic mosses. You could use aquatic mosses on the wood. Yeah, yeah. We have any. Aquatic moss. Yeah, I've got any travel uh, traveller. Um, good question. I don't think we have because we were talking about it before you came. You? Oh no, we haven't. Oh, we've got some of this. Oh. Day. This, this is similar. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, let's try that. Let's make some more fern as well in there. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna. We found something bit. similar. Java burn. I want to get in there, get yeah. in the little land. <laughs> I'm actually going to try Java fern, half immersed, half submersed. Oh, yeah. Alright, this is an experiment. I've never done this before. This is actually a liverwort, it's not a moss. Yeah. Known as Pelia, common name is Pelia. But I think if we glue this on strategic points along the wood, it'll look really cool in the long term. 
This glue's awesome, by the way. It's a bit more rubbery, is it? A bit yeah, more jelly-like. Yeah, it's jelly-like, uh, jelly yeah, so I'm going to get some of that. So, really important, just tiny little dobs. Well, I see, yeah, it is actually easy to work with, isn't it? Yeah. It's, more, so, it's not like running... Um, no, not like liquidy. So, just get a little bit of a hellier. to let these things establish a bit, don't you? Do you know what I mean? It, 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 in the respect that, that there is probably a bit of a time delay before you put the animals in. Yeah, I would. I'd, I'd wait a good three weeks. Yeah. I do that in aquatics as well. I won't put fish yeah. in straight away. Let, every, let everything... Um... I like, yeah, I like to spend time like, researching and choosing what animal I want to use as well. Mm -hmm. It's been really crazy now. Putting that underneath it. Yeah. What glue is this, please? Well, this is a glue that we um, were actually, we have a company coming, it's called Superfish Aquarium Glue. Um, and when you look at it, it is a slightly, um, it's produced for aquadistry. So if I go over to the box, I can show, we have it here at the store. Uh, you can always give us a ring and we can perhaps put some in the post to you. Uh, but it's basically Superfish Aquascaping Glue. Um, when will these be for sale in Canada? Well, the, the product, the bio pod, is produced by some guys at Calgary. They're watching in now. I'm presuming these have gone live already in Canada, have they? The bipods, or are we not sure? Do you know, George? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I imagine so. Um. <laughs> Do we know whether these bipods are launched in Canada yet? Uh, they're not yet, as far as I know. Tom's watching. Tom's watching. Tom, darling, I don't know if you're listening. Um, when is your launch date for the bipod in Canada? Um, hopefully, Amanda, Tom will see this question um, as um, the guys that um, own the business are in Calgary so um, already for sale says Kel Leslie Mo. now yeah as long as you're in Canada Kel um, that's cool I don't know why we've got this fly on the top <laughs> the flies like the, the line from Peregrine <laughs> that is looking absolutely tremendous now isn't it <laughs> do you know, I think it's like a lot of things. If you give yourself the time and you make the commitment to do it, but us, that we're all very busy people, aren't we? It's almost like, right. Too much empty space here. looking stunning. I'm loving um, he split the ferns, didn't he? These ferns that he split here look lovely, don't they? These ferns you split here looking absolutely stunning. 
Yeah, and you hook those in with the metal hook, did you, or just push them in again? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're actually fine. Um, a bit fiddly. And they, ideally, they're still going to be a little bit longer. But, um, I, think I think if I do, it's like a, in part of one of their kits. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's going to, yeah, I'm going to go to sort of that. Yeah, that'll come up. Yeah, it's it's about the line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, ready for best of our water now. I think it's going to be a bit of moss right here. It's nice to have some open space. A little mature up a bit. Realised I'm losing the battery pack. <laughs> I might just put a bit of piece of land on it to see if I can grow it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Isn't it? What's that? Maintenance. Hello. Um, I think it, it, it is video, but it's that. It's not that it's a pink product in the UK. So take it to the camera. you have this again? I'll see if I can get my camera set up again for another. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I mean. Free to get in my way if I know it's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Do you have an idea of how many plants have been used so far? No. We'll go through the things and, and uh, <laughs> we'll find out exactly what we're doing. Very much. Okay, well, what's the nice thing about the Um, the lodge room. You don't want to do it. 
Yeah, that's a good point. So I normally use a colander, but this is an express thing just to disperse the water. If I pour this straight in, it's just going to create a massive divot in the gravel. Disturbing the gravel a little bit, but not too much. You're right. Yep. Actually, you just okay. try and escape. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of those plants will be happy even if they're sort of half in the water, half out the water. These, yeah, yeah, yeah these are all um, semi-aquatic, yeah, amphibious, so yeah, all these ones here. 
grow in and out of water. Got any um, pea gravel? Pea gravel, natural pea gravel. Pea gravel. Another little trick. So we're talking details now. It's the main thing's done, but it's all about the details matter. You just help it make it even more natural. So it's going to be similar texture, similar colour and texture to the smaller gravel. So just add that around the stone. And it just makes it look even more natural. And then you can make any minor adjustments. Your tweezers. in the UK. Here we go. So um, just to wrap it all up then, so this is a Biopod Aqua 2, uh, available now in the UK, uh, retails for 699 US Pound, uh, US, US. US. <laughs> what the hell? Uh, yeah, English pounds sterling. Um, start from the top, LED lighting, UVA, UVB, infrared, all controllable via your app. Uh, living wall area at the back, which we filled with uh, moss to start with. Uh, we've got this cool sort of air ventilation, we've got substrate heating, everything's monitored, all kind of smart micro habitat. The aquascaping itself, we put our substrate in, uh, we put our rocks in and our wood, and then we went about attaching all of our beautiful terrestrial plants, courtesy of Peregrine Life Foods. So, I really hope you enjoyed that, guys. The live stream will be available in your own time uh, later on, so if you haven't got time to watch it, yeah, do so. Uh, I'm not sure how long that's taken me, about two hours? Yes. Yeah? Yes. So it um, just shows what you can achieve with the right materials, a little bit of thought going into the layout, the, the textures and the colours. Uh, getting that hardscape right to start with, that's really important part of the process. 
and you can see if you remember back to when I did the hardscape totally changed you, you know a lot of it's covered up with the plants but you can see that it's acted as a skeleton the plants somewhere for the plants to attach to you've got visible bits of hardscape you've got parts that are hidden by the plants just looks really natural it represents a kind of jungle layout I've done a little bit of aquascaping underneath as well so some of the textures are replicated by the textures above the water we've added some detailing with some pea gravel around the stone just to add that little bit of extra detail um, I'm really looking forward to following the progress so no, no. pressure <laughs> Uh, I'll be tempted to leave it a while before adding animals because of the yeah, technique no, I, I use to um, attach the plants. I kind of let them do their own thing and anchor, anchor themselves a little bit more securely. Just no rush. Yeah. And as with anything, do do your research before adding any any living animals to an enclosed system. Okay, guys, thanks for watching on the live stream. Thanks to all my real audience right here. I'm gonna have a little break. And then think about my Aquascaper 900, which I'm doing at half past six, so I've got three hours to relax. Okay, yeah. Cheers, guys. Keep on skating. Yeah.